Okay, I hope I have a best side. It's good to be here. It's good to see all of you folks again. Uh, see a lot of familiar faces. And these young people are growing up, aren't they? Amen. Doesn't take them long. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be back with this church and also the pastor and his wife. Uh, we had a meal a while ago and uh, talked about a lot of things. And the uh, Lord's good to all of us, isn't he? He really is good to all of us. Amen. And uh, thankful to be back here. I uh, remember being here before. Uh, kind of would have lost my way had we not followed the pastor. But once we got on the right road, I remembered those things. My wife did. And so it's good to be here with you tonight. Since uh, I guess I've seen you last, my wife and I are living in Liberty, Indiana. A uh, church there where we were helping a pastor uh, because we had camped there in, in that area. And we started going to church there and helping him. He was 58 years old. He died with cancer. And so my wife was playing the piano and I was leading the singing and I was telling your pastor and his wife a while ago that uh, the people asked us what we were gonna do. And we had been going to Florida in the winter and then staying in Ohio and Indiana in the summer. And we said, we will stay with you till you get a pastor. And so they had about four guys in and uh, I didn't hear anything about it. I, we would be gone when they would uh, come in and view of a call. And so they asked me what I was going to do. And I said, I'll stay with you till you get a pastor. And so then time went by and I was still preaching. And they said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'll stay with you till you get a pastor. They said, how about you being our pastor? I said, I'm retired. They said, we know that. But would you consider it? I said, only if the Lord's in it. If he's not in it, I'm going back to the sunshine in Florida. I'm not staying in these cold winters anymore. So the Lord was in it. And this August, we've been, uh, been pastor there for three years. Amen. And uh, it's a good bunch of people, and they love the Lord to this country, everyday, ordinary people. And that's the kind of people I like to be around. And so Amen. I thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I trust uh, that you'll be praying. I know you've already been praying that you'll continue to pray about this meeting this week and see what the Lord has in store for us. I can't tell you how excited uh, that my wife and I are, are to be here. They really are. And we appreciate every opportunity that we have uh, to be with folks and the churches and, and the services and so forth. And so thank you very kindly. Thank you, Pastor Amen. and Church, for having Amen. us here in this place. Well, I'm going to preach a message tonight from Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And the title is, If I Should Die Before I Wake. If I Should Die before I wake. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 27. We read this a lot of times at funerals, but my dad always said, you need to preach these messages while people are living. Right. And so uh, tonight in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity to be here at Faith Baptist Church and these wonderful people, wonderful pastor and wife and family. We thank you, Lord, for every opportunity that we have to be together this side of eternity. We pray that the meeting this week will be a meeting that will bring honor and glory to you. You alone are deserving of all the honor and the glory and the exaltation and the praise, and that's who we want to uh, receive that from all of us. And so we thank you for these services. We pray that you'll be pleased with the services. We pray that if there's lost people, that they would be saved. And us. those of us who are saved would be drawn closer to thee. We ask you to forgive us of our sin. Be with these that are bereaved. Be with these that are ill. And Lord, comfort their hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The little prayer that we used to pray as a child, maybe you young people remember this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. You know, most of us now, a lot of us here tonight, uh, we were talking to Pastor and his wife about, my wife and I, celebrating our 53rd anniversary this coming August. And he said, what year did you get married? We said, 1966. And you said? My wife was born in 67. His wife was born in 67. Now, you know what I'm experiencing, so that makes you feel old, doesn't it? But I think about this. I think the older that we get, and I've asked different congregations, how many of you ever thought you would be the age that you are if you're over 50? And nobody would raise their hand because most of us, when we were growing up, we thought people that were married were old. 
And then we thought people that had children were older. And then people that had grandchildren, they were really old. And people that had great-grandchildren, they are really, really past time for them to be in heaven. Amen. And uh, so we're at that point. My wife and I, we have our first great-grandchild, about three months old. And we're going to spoil her just like they're spoiling their grandchild. You, you folks know how that is tonight. But the older we become, the more that I think that we consider our time of death. I've been at the hospitals. I've been at the houses. Uh, I've been in places where people were in a rest home. And I've been there when those people have passed out into eternity. And I'll tell you this. There's a difference when a person is saved and they pass out into eternity. That's right. And my dad, when he died in 2009, my brother and myself were the only two uh, children. And all of our family was around dad's bed. He was in hospice in Hamilton, Ohio. And uh, we were singing songs and choruses like tonight. Uh, we were quoting scripture. And uh, we were just surrounded uh, his bed because they said he didn't have much longer to live. And I'll never forget what happened that night. My dad, that afternoon, my dad kind of looked up. And he got a smile on his face. And he was gone. A judge's wife, the judge and his wife attended our church some there when I pastored in Ohio and she said it's a different different feeling when you walk into your dad's room and some of these other rooms she said there's an aura about it because you're Christians you know the Lord and, and you're not begging for your loved one to stay you're you're asking God to keep them from pain and keep them from suffering and all of those kind of things and so my dad went out to eternity. I've seen other people, and they say, I see the lights, I see the lights, or there he is, or whatever. And I don't know about that, because I've never done that. But I do know that as a Christian, we ought to go out as a Christian. We ought to be praising God for the life that he has given us, the family that he's given us, the church that he's given us, and all of those things that he's blessed us with. And I think the older we get, we think about this. I've had a good life. I really have. I've had a good life. And God has blessed me and my wife and our family immensely. And we have no regrets except what we have failed to do in our Christian life. But we have no regrets of what God has done for us. And so you think about that. And uh, I remember when my mother and dad, they talked to me. And they said, we want to go pick out our plots in the cemetery. And uh, we want to pick out our caskets. And I went with them to do that. My brother wasn't there at that time, and he came in from West Virginia that day, and when he got there, he said, what have y'all been doing today? And Dad said, we've been picking out our caskets, and we've been uh, paying for our burial plots and all that. My brother said, that sounds like a really good time. I'm sorry I missed that, you know? That's the kind of thing that he thought about. But my dad went out into eternity, and my mother wants to go. My mother's 94 years old. She asked why. Is God leaving me here? But she witnesses to everybody. She's in a rest home. She witnesses to everybody that comes in there. She invites them to our church. Amen. And when we meet with the doctors and nurses and staff, they say, your mother is trying to build up your congregation because she invites everybody to go there where you pastor. So we're thankful for that. So as you think about that tonight, think about if I should die before I wake. What, what are the things that you think about that you would like to do and want to do before you die? First of all, I think all of us would say this, I want to make sure of my salvation. I want to make sure that I know Christ is my personal Savior. I don't want to have any doubts about that. I want to know that when I leave this life, immediately my spirit goes to be with the Lord. I want to know that. And you say, well, we do know that. That's true. But the old devil sometimes, he puts doubts in our mind. He said, if you're saved, why do you talk like that? Why do you act like that? Why do you lose your temper? Why, why, why? And sometimes we even doubt that. But we remember the time that Christ saved us, when the Holy Spirit convicted our heart, and we begged Christ to forgive us of our sin and to save our wretched, vile soul. We remember that. And we go back to that time. And we remember it, and we think about that all the time. But there are a lot of people in life that they're not sure about their salvation. They go through life and they have questions and they have doubts. And as a pastor, you have people talk to you all the time about things like this. I've had men, I've had preachers come to my office and say, Brother Riddick, 
I want to know for sure that I know Christ is my personal Savior. I'm talking about men that have been pastoring. Men that have been in the ministry a long time. They've asked me about that. And everybody that walks the face of this earth that claims to be a Christian, we need to make sure that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is our Savior. And some people will say, well, I, you know, you talk to people about being saved. We talked to a young man tonight at the restaurant. He said, I'm a born-again Baptist. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. And we talk to people and they say, here's what they say. Well, I'm a good person. <coughs> when they compare themselves to us, maybe so. But when they compare themselves to the Lord, we don't measure up, do we? We don't. Listen, some of them will say, I've been baptized. The Bible does not say anything about baptism getting you to heaven. Do you know that? The, ba the Bible doesn't say anything about being a good person. The Bible doesn't say anything about the church you're a member of that gets you to heaven. The Bible says, for by grace, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Listen to this. Not of works, lest any man should boast. God knows us, doesn't he? Well, I gave $1,000 to the church. I know I'm going to heaven. Well, I gave $1,500. Well, I gave $2,000. Well, I gave $3,000. And on and on it goes. God knows us. It's not of our works. And let me say this to you tonight. If there was any other way that we could get to heaven, then God would not have sent his only begotten son to die at Calvary That's for right. sinners like us and shed his precious blood. That's right. If we could be saved by baptism, he wouldn't have had to die. If we could be saved by good works, he wouldn't have had to die. If we could be saved because we're an honest person, then he wouldn't have had to die. But I know your pastor, and I, I preached on it just recently about the crucifixion and about the resurrection and all of that. And let me say this to you. The, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was humiliating. He died as a criminal. They, they tortured him. They beat him to where you couldn't even recognize him. They, they put a crown of thorns on his head. They ran a spear in his side. They, they put nails in his hands and in his feet. And listen, if we could be saved any other way, that wouldn't have had to happen. You think about that? And then people will say to you, hey, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. Well, most of us think we're a pretty good guy, don't we? Now, we don't want a second opinion, but we do think we're pretty good sometimes. We get a second opinion. But if I knew I was going to die tonight, I'd want to make sure that I had asked Christ to forgive me of my sins and to save my soul. Let me tell you this. I was thinking about these young people tonight, and I appreciate you all singing. I appreciate you standing up here. And uh, I, pre I really appreciate that. I love young people. My wife and I were youth directors for a long time. When I was 11 years old, my dad was pastor of a church, Baptist Church in Arkansas. And uh, I would go to church, and my dad would preach. And uh, we would sing songs. We'd sing the invitation. Uh, we'd go home. What happened to me was this. The, the Holy Spirit of God, I didn't realize and recognize what it was because I was just a young person, and I'd heard a little bit about it, but I didn't, I didn't get it, really. I didn't absorb it. The Holy Spirit of God began to convict me of my sins. And when my dad would preach, I felt like he was preaching right to me. And I knew the Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. I was 11 years old. I wasn't into drinking. I wasn't into drugs. I wasn't a robbery or none of those things. But I was a sinner in the sight of God. And one night after church on a Sunday night, I went to the back of the house just as far as I could get away from my parents because every meal my parents would pray for their sons. Every sermon I felt like was preached to me. But that night, that was the conviction was so strong within me that I felt like that if I died right then, I was going to burn in hell forever. And I didn't want to burn in hell. I wanted to go to heaven when I died. And my brother was talking to my parents. He was younger than me, and he wouldn't let it go. He wanted to be saved so bad, and he just kept on and kept on. And I went and hid in the house. I finally thought, well, everything's over. I can go out. Everything will be okay. And I got about halfway to the living room, an old farmhouse, cold and old in floor in the fall and my mother said you know what happened to your brother I'll tell you what I did I fell on my knees on that old cold and lonely floor and I begged God to save my soul to forgive me of my sins and to save my soul and he did Amen. and when the old devil gives me doubts I go back to that time I know it was real because I was there and the Lord was there with me he Amen. saved me that night 
But listen, if I had doubts about it, I'd want to make sure, wouldn't you? When a casket is laid out here in front and a person's laying in there and, and their testimony is they're a Christian and you know they went to heaven and you go by there and you think, if that were me, do I know for sure that I would be in heaven with the Lord? We all need to make sure. Make your calling and election sure. The Bible talks about that. Faith in God and not anyone else. So think about that. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So I would make sure, if I knew I was going to die tonight, I would make sure that I knew Christ as my Savior. Secondly, I would let others know that I love them. You know, I don't know why it is, but growing up, our family was not really a lot, of, uh, there was not a lot of affection. But I knew my parents loved me. I, I knew when they spanked me, they said they loved me. And they said, this is going to hurt us worse than it hurts you. I said, let's save everybody the trouble. Amen? Let's save everybody the trouble. You don't have to do that. But they did anyway. But my parents loved me. And I love my parents. My mother's in the nursing home, as I mentioned a while ago. And, and I love her. And, and I'm not ashamed now to tell people that I love them. I love the members of our church. I tell them every once in a while. I, I love you folks. I thank God for you. Listen, I can say this to you folks that I know right here tonight. I love you. I thank God for your, your faithfulness. I thank God for your service to him. I thank God for you being here tonight. I thank God for you having me and my wife here. I thank God for, for you praying for us. I thank God for that. Why wouldn't you love people like that? People are easy to love. And I thank God that, that we can say that we love people. A lot of people don't ever say that. They don't ever hear that. But I love you is three words that mean a lot to so many people. In our darkest hour and the time we're down and out, and somebody just comes up and say, Preacher, I love you. I thank God for you. Man, I'm going to tell you, that does a lot for you. That does a lot for you. Same thing was true with the church members. I've had church members that were down and out, and they were going through some tough times. And I'd go and have prayer with them. I said, I want you to know our people love you. And we love you, but most of all, God loves you. I remember when my dad died, there was a young preacher that texted me or emailed me or something. And he said, as much as you love your dad, there's somebody that loves your dad more than you. And that's our Heavenly Father. Amen. You think about that. His love is shed abroad in our hearts. That's why we love each other. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. The Bible teaches in 1 John that we're to love. We know we pass from death into life because we love the brethren. We like to be with the people of God. We like to be with our church family. We, we like to rejoice together. We like to see folks saved together. We, we just like to be together. And a lot of folks don't understand that. But that's because we love each other, don't we? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we love one another. We thank God for every person that he's brought into our lives my wife and i when we first went to florida we were visiting churches and we found a, a church much like this church here and uh, they were meeting in a house and uh, we were there and they had lunch that day and that day there was a couple of preachers and their wives that came over to the table we were due didn't know anybody and they came and sat at our table and they made us feel welcome and, and then we got acquainted with them. We'd go out and eat with them. We, we would worship together and all those kind of things. And the lady just died. She was 87 years old. And she just died. But, but they were like our family. In fact, many times the church family is closer than our own family because we have loved ones that are lost. We don't really have a lot in common. We pray for them. We write them letters, tell them we love them. We're praying to be saved, all, the, all those kind of things. But, but our brothers and sisters in Christ, there's something special about them. There's a bond. That's why we can go to different places and be in different uh, churches, and I'm talking about Baptist churches, and be with other people, and it's just like we're family. We love each other. We're on the same page. We, we, we're saved by the grace of God and, and saved and, and we're Baptist like that young man said tonight in the service. But we love one another. That's not hard to say, is it? I love you. I tell my wife every once in a while, I say, honey, I love you. And you know what she says? I love you too. I like that. I like to hear that, don't you? That, that, that makes you feel good. We've been married almost 53 years and we're still in love. And I thank God for that. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Amen. Thirdly, I would forgive all who have wronged me. If I knew I was going to die tonight, I would forgive everybody that's ever wronged me. And you know, a lot of people don't come to church because somebody wronged them. They disagreed with somebody. They got their feelings hurt. 
and all of that. And, and I understand that. People are people, and, and they're going to sometimes hurt your feelings, and sometimes they're going to uh, upset you, and sometimes they're going to make you angry. I understand that. But I'm going to tell you something. They do the same thing to the preacher. They do the same thing to the preacher. When my dad was pastoring, there were some people that tried to run him off in Ohio. And uh, uh, he said, well, unless the Lord moves me, I can't go. I've got to stay here. I'm afraid he'd kill me if I left. And so my dad stayed. Those people left. Well, then another preacher came, and he went to the, where they were meeting, and, and he was their pastor. And they did the same thing to him. They wanted him to leave. They didn't want him to pastor anymore. And his son, his oldest son, got out of church. And here's what happened. His oldest son was so upset at the way their parents were treated that he got out of church. The pastor called me. I, was, I wasn't pastor, and I was just a young uh, man, a youth director, and an associate pastor, and he said, I want you to talk to my son. So I went to the son, and he started talking about the way the people in the church had treated his dad and mom. And I said, I know, because that's the same people that treated my parents like that. But I asked God for wisdom. Here's what I asked God for. Give me wisdom to talk to this young man to help him. And here's what God gave me. He didn't speak out loud, just to impress my heart. I said, here's the problem. You're not quitting on those people. You're quitting on God. You think about that? We love God. God's good to us. Why would we quit on him? Because of somebody else? We're not going to let them uh, cause us to, to get angry and leave and not worship anymore? No. And so I talked to the young man, and he, he said, I'm not making any promises. And about a year later, his dad called me. He said, guess what? I said, what? He said, my son, he'd left town. He was pastoring in the uh, Somerset, Kentucky area. And his son had moved there. And his son got in church and got faithful, and he was teaching Sunday school. Amen. And I never forgot about that. And I've, I've said that to myself so, so many times. I can't quit on God. I can't give up on God. I, I can't quit doing what God wants me to do because not everybody likes me or whatever the case may be. But if I, I, whatever they've done to me, listen, I forgive them. I forgive them. I forgive them. I, I don't have any anger. I don't have any bitterness in my heart. And, and you ask my wife if we've been done wrong, absolutely. But I don't have any bitterness. I'm a happy Christian. God's been better to me than I deserve. And so I don't have any complaint. If I were to die tonight, I would forgive those who wronged me. Fourthly, I would ask forgiveness from all who I have wronged. Have you ever done that? Why is it so hard for us to say, I'm sorry? Why is it so hard to say, will you forgive me? Why is that so hard? But it is difficult. People have a hard time with that. It's hard to admit that we are wrong. But God knows our heart. And I would ask people to forgive me for the ones that I've wronged. You remember when the prodigal son went away? And he got over there and he was eating. He would have eaten the husk from the swine's food and all that kind of stuff. And, and he was down and out. He didn't have any friends. Didn't have any money and all. And he said, my father's servants have better than I had. And so he started on his way home. And his father met him. And he said, get the robe, get the ring, get the fatted calf. My son who was gone, he is back. He is home. And we're going to celebrate. Do you remember that story in the Bible? 